Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our program. The launch of the Heritage Foundation's 2024 China Transparency Report. Please welcome Heritage President Dr. Kevin Roberts. Welcome and to all of you here and of course those of you who've joined online, you're in for a real treat. Of course, the preview is that as we look at this 2024 China Transparency Report, not all of the news is good. And so this is, uh, at th this week at Heritage is filled with uh, sort of bad news and good news. The bad news is we have a lot to fix. The good news is this is America and we're going to fix it. As, as Ronald Reagan said, if you can't make them see the light, make them feel the heat. And that is the spirit behind this transparency report. Give you a little bit of a, a preview before I introduce my, my good friend and colleague who will then introduce the panelists. Essentially, the world is awakening. All of us at Heritage are awakening. I myself awakening to a reality that we didn't anticipate 10 or 12 years ago when we really saw China as a great friend. Under the leadership of Xi Jinping in particular, the Chinese Communist Party has become the number one adversary, not just for Americans, but for free people around the world. The spirit of this report is A, to confront that reality, and B, to figure out what to do about it. Because you know at Heritage, we're not merely going to tell you what the problems are, we're also going to lay out some solutions. And it is a very genuine compliment by me to my colleagues here that I'm extraordinarily proud of the work that they've put into this over the years. I'm particularly proud of the work they put into this year's report because in some circles, it's not politically correct to speak so plainly about the Chinese Communist Party being an adversary. Of course, we love the Chinese people. It's a beautiful culture. We're pulling for them to be able to overcome all of the, the evils, frankly, of that regime. But one of the ways we're going to do that as American friends is by, as we like to say here at Heritage, reading reality truthfully. So you're in for a treat with this panel. My, my friend and colleague, Jeff Smith, who of course would not take much credit for this, but he deserves a lot of it, is the head of our Asia Studies Center. In addition to being smart and charming and all of those things, he's also just a lot of fun to work with. So please join me in welcoming Jeff Smith to the stage. Thanks to everyone who's come out today to hear our presentation, and of course, a big thanks to Dr. Roberts. He is a, a man of his word. When he came over and took, uh, took over as president of the Heritage Foundation, he said China would be a priority for this organization, and he has proved that week after week. Um, China has become one of the seven building-wide strategic priorities for Heritage, and I've never seen so much focus and attention on this threat as I've seen over the past year. Um, a huge thanks is in order to Andrew Harding, a research assistant in our Asian Studies Center, who did the bulk of work project in, um, in editing, in shepherding it through the editing process, the graph working with the graphics department, finding the authors, really an incredible job. Uh, big thanks to Andrew. Big thanks to Michael Cunningham in the Asian Studies Center for content editing. Big thanks to Dr. Victoria Coates for her leadership as a vice president of our foreign policy and uh, our national security and defense uh, institute. And big thanks to the heritage support staff, all of the um, copy editors, the graphics department. What is the China Transparency Report? What are we here to talk about today? Uh, I want to get down to the meat of it as quickly as possible, but we have some bookkeeping we have to do first. This is the second edition of the Transparency Report. The first edition came out in 2021, and this project was designed to look into the state of transparency with China. It's broken up into two broad categories. The first part is eight distinct chapters dedicated to examining the state of official transparency in China across eight fields, economy, energy and environment, human rights, 
influence operations, military, outbound investments, politics and law, and technology. In each of these fields, we examine what is our state of understanding of China's policy? What is the state of information that we have, official information being published by the Chinese government? What is the quality of our data, and how reliable is that data? Is our information and our understanding increasing or decreasing with time? Is China becoming more or less transparent? Importantly, then, what is the state of private efforts to fill the gaps in that data? Where do we have think tanks, research organizations, consulting groups working to fill some of the gaps in that data? And in many cases, there are excellent efforts underway. In many cases, there's much more work that needs to be done. And part of the value of the transparency report is to identify those gaps. Where do we need more attention, resources, and focus in the years to come? Where is our understanding shrinking? The second part of uh, the China Transparency Report are is six topical essays from guest authors. We have three of them up with me today on the panel. I think there are two more in the audience. Uh, unfortunately, our, our sixth author couldn't make it today. Um, but this is what I'd like to dive into in our, our short time uh, this morning. The six topical essays, uh, the first is focused on genocide in Xinjiang by Dr. Adrian Zenz, who is familiar to many of you, the one author who wasn't able to make it today. But Dr. Zenz is a senior fellow and director in China studies at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. His uh, guest chapter provides new evidence to show how Beijing is intent on targeting the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and other ethnic groups in ways that constitute genocide. Uh, Cleo Pascal, who I believe is here today, is a non-resident senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Her chapter looks into Chinese activity in the Pacific Islands uh, and exposes the consequence of China's growing influence and influence operations in that critical region of the world. Uh, uh, Chris uh, Icovella has a guest chapter on how Wall Street is funding China's rise. He is the president and CEO of the American Securities Association. Uh, and his chapter illustrates how the CCP has methodically exploited US capital markets to fund military, cyber, and geopolitical strategy that undermines the economic and national security interests of the United States. And the last three we have, uh, last three chapters we have the author is with us today, and we'll get to do a little bit more of an in-depth discussion on these three chapters. First up, we have uh, a chapter co-authored by Andrew Harding, our, our research assistant, and Dr. Nadia Shadlow, focused on the defense industrial base here in the United States. Dr. Shadlow is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and former U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategy. Um, the chapter analyzes nearly a decade's worth of industrial capabilities reports to the U.S. Congress uh, to show uh, what is lacking in America's defense industrial base at the moment. Dr. George Calhoun, um, farthest to my left, uh, is a professor and director of the Hanlon Financial Systems Center at the Stevens Institute of Technology. His chapter does a deep dive into the COVID data uh, that China presented to the world. Uh, it, it does a deep dive to demonstrate how grossly the CCP suppressed and misrepresented data on COVID-19's impact inside of China. And finally, Dr. Willie Wolap Lam is a senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation, and his chapter provides expert analysis on General Secretary Xi Jinping's um, reconstitution of the one-man rule of Mao and his construction of a 24-hour, all-weather, AI-enabled surveillance system to weed out dissidents. So a wide range of topics and issues covered in the report. Um, we're happy to go into any of these uh, topics in greater detail in, in Q&A. But while we have the three uh, authors present on the panel, I would love to dive into your unique chapters in the time we have here. Um, Dr. Lamb, perhaps we could start with you since you're the closest to me. 
Uh, I've been reading your analysis of elite politics in China for over 15 years now, so it's a real treasure to have you present with us. Um, I wonder if you could provide the audience with a, a general overview of, of your chapter and maybe some of the, the key highlights and takeaways from Xi's consolidation of power and his uh, increasing movement toward one-man rule. OK, thank you very much. It's indeed a great privilege on my part to be uh, invited as a speaker at this uh, distinguished institution. Uh, well, uh, I'll just speak for about five minutes. Uh, well, first of all, I think um, let me make clear the most important thing, and that is uh, despite the fact that uh, Xi Jinping has accumulated more enemies than uh, those of his two predecessors, uh, former presidents uh, Jiang Zemin and uh, former president Hu Jintao combined, uh, his uh, enemies have not been able to uh, put together the common front, they cannot uh, coalesce their powers against uh, Xi Jinping. So uh, other things being equal, Xi Jinping will likely uh, have his uh, fourth five-year term. That means uh, running from 2027 to 2032. Uh, by 2032, he will be 79 years old, uh, an age comparable uh, to that of the two uh, front runners in the uh, US elections right now. And uh, you must remember that in the Chinese context, uh, we, well, we Chinese uh, revere old age. So a person uh, in his 70s, like myself, uh, is considered to have barely crossed the threshold into uh, middle age, OK? So uh, uh, Xi Jinping, um, however, uh, despite the fact that he has been widely uh, disparaged for knowing very little about uh, international finance, uh, economics, and so forth, he's a past master in uh, palace intrigue, Machiavellian style uh, uh, cut and thrust within the top echelon of the party. So uh, when he first came to power in 2012, uh, there were two major uh, um, cliques within the party, the Shanghai Gang, led by Jiang Jimin, and the uh, Communist Jew clique, uh, clique, led by Hu Jintao. But after 10 years, lo and behold, now everybody on the Central Committee and the uh, Politburo are pretty much members of the Xi Jinping faction. However, recently we have seen um, aberrations and strange happenings because uh, somewhat like Stalin, uh, well, Stalin, uh, most of his career got rid of most of his political foes. And, but at the last stage of Stalin's career, he began to uh, turn in on his own protégés. He began a purge of people whom he had handpicked for the loyalty and uh, who were supposed to be his successors. So something similar is happening uh, in China. Xi Jinping recently arrested uh, a few dozen uh, Major generals, lieutenant generals, full generals, uh, working in key areas of the PLA, such as the the rocket force, the uh, equipment procurement departments, uh, the uh, logistics support department, and so forth. So, meaning that uh, in this one area, which is considered to be Xi Jinping's only forte, that means uh, high level management of personnel and um, Machiavellian style uh, cut and thrust within the top echelon. Uh, he has failed to uh, now uh, groom a group of leaders on whom he could trust. So this has uh, wide implications uh, policy wise, uh, including towards Taiwan, because if uh, the PLA is in a big mess. Uh, Xi Jinping might, uh, from one perspective, consider uh, postponing the uh, invasion of uh, Taiwan, which I think is not a matter of whether, but a, 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 an issue of when. Uh, turning to other issues within the Chinese administration, uh, Xi's um, turning the whole decision-making uh, process into a, what Mao Zedong called a one echo chamber results in the fact that uh, economic and financial policies are in a big mess. Uh, well, recently, uh, particularly after his uh, tete -a tete with Joe Biden in San Francisco in November, uh, Xi Jinping's people have persuaded him to switch to a something like a smile diplomacy, as evidenced by uh, Prime Minister Li Chang's uh, uh, speech at Davos, the World Economic Forum. But, uh, these have been totally ineffective. Uh, we have seen 
uh, huge multinationals, uh, Goldman Sachs, um, uh, <clears throat> Morgan Stanley, uh, Walmart, uh, Apple, and Foxconn, and so forth, leaving the country to the extent that uh, in, in the last previous quarter of uh, of the year, China, for the first time since its entry to the World Trade Organization in uh, 2001, uh, registered a negative FDI. That means more multinationals were pulling money out of China than they were investing in China to the tune of uh, 11.8 billion US dollars. So uh, the economy is in the dire strait, and uh, with this type of uh, personality cult, highly personalized style of uh, running such a huge and diverse country, I'm afraid that the um, economy will continue to tank. And uh, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, Xi Jinping, who is deeply uh, obsessed and convinced of the fact that uh, the East is rising and the West is declining, uh, and that he is now pulling all the stops to put together a, a so-called axis of autocratic states together with Russia, North Korea, Iran, Pakistan, and so forth, uh, uh, in an effort to uh, establish a, a so-called rival international order, separate from that uh, headed by the U.S., uh, the country is facing uh, tough questions, both on this economy and uh, its uh, foreign relations, particularly uh, its uh, geopolitical contention uh, with um, uh, U.S.-led uh, allies in both in Europe and in Asia, such as um, Japan, South Korea, and now the Philippines and Vietnam, and to some extent India. So I think uh, the country is paying a huge price for Xi Jinping's style of uh, one echo chamber uh, style decision making. Dr. Lam, if I could ask a quick follow-up. Does China's changing economic fortunes and trajectory at all uh, challenge Xi's consolidation of one-party rule? Does it change his calculus or his incentives? Does it maybe even make him more motivated to consolidate power? Does it create uh, any opposition forces within the Well, I, I think the, the, the second part of your conjecture is true. Uh, we have witnessed uh, an exponential rise in protests, mainly coming from two groups of people. The first group uh, consists of people who have already paid fully for the apartment, but those apartments remain unfinished. Okay, so uh, these uh, poor folks, uh, having paid uh, two or three million RMB, could not move into their fully paid apartments, and they, are, they still have to pay mortgages to the banks. Okay, the second group consists of uh, bona fide uh, depositors in uh, state-owned banks uh, as well as the subsidiaries. Uh, of course, in any, in any country, uh, if you are a rightful depositor, you could uh, voluntarily, I mean, you could anytime pull money out of your bank. But in China, this is not so, okay? If you have 20 million bucks in uh, RMB in the banks, you are allowed only to pull out uh, four or 5,000 uh, RMB every day. And, uh, uh, not to mention the fact that you have to uh, arrive at the bank at uh, 4 or 5 a.m. In, in the morning in order to get into the queue because the bank has a quota. They, they will only serve 40, 50 people. In other words, the bank will close, okay? So you have to get to the bank 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning. So uh, this has led to uh, a very angry protests by uh, depos depositors. Uh, so the, the, up, the, the result is that um, uh, she is boosting China's already very formidable, as you indicated, 24-hour, uh, um, all-dimensional, multi-dimensional AI-assisted uh, uh, national security apparatus, uh, surveillance and control apparatus, which still works, despite the fact that uh, in many local uh, governments, uh, they don't even have the money to pay the civil servants, including to pay the police. So that's why uh, Xi Jinping is reviving what Mao Zedong did, and that is to uh, establish and create um, local level militias. So now you see militias, uh, militias being created within uh, big uh, SOEs, state-owned enterprises, and also private enterprises. Okay, so these militias are being paid for by the SOEs and the private enterprises, and the uh, remit is not just to. Uh, 
control law and order within the enterprise, but also uh, uh, people living in the vicinity. Okay, and uh, uh, Xi Jinping has also revived this uh, draconian uh, policy of um, uh, common, uh, what I call, what I can translate as. Uh, uh, common complicity uh, within 10 families. That means every rural area is divided into groups of 10 families, okay? And if one member of the 10 family commits a crime, then every other member of the nine other families have to suffer the same punishment, okay? This was something invented by the first emperor of China, the Qin, uh, who ruled in uh, 200 years BC, okay? But this has now been revived by Xi Jinping. This uh, mechanism of uh, common uh, cross-family uh, complicity. Okay, so uh, as a result of which uh, these groups of ten families uh, they 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 watch on each other, and uh, if they see somebody suspicious, uh, somebody who has a, a friend who looks like a Uyghur, then they they give a report to the police, and they might get. Uh, 2,000 yuan reward, okay? So we have descended to this level, which uh, we had never thought possible uh, coming to China, which after all is the uh, second largest economy in the world and the largest uh, trading trading power in, uh, in the world, right? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shadlow, your chapter was a little different from yeah. some of the others in that it shined a transparent light back on the United States and some failings in our own uh, defense industrial base. Nevertheless, a key component of dealing with and grappling with the China challenge. What struck you the most when you dove into the past reports about the U.S. defense industrial base? Where are we falling behind? Uh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, it, it was different in that it was more U.S. focused. But I do think Andrew and I should get a special award for having read through 10 years of defense industrial base reports. <laughs> Not pretty. <laughs> Not an easy read. But what we did find um, was actually, and it's, it's kind of a bit depressing, um, fundamentally we found that for over 10 years, probably 15 years, uh, we've highlighted problems in our defense industrial base. So some of the, for instance, in 2013, um, What's interesting is there are very few mentions of China. So we do see an increase in mentions of China over time. Um, 2013, very few. I think Andrew pointed out four mentions of China. 2018, much more. That was one year after the Trump administration uh, came in. And so China was described then as a strategic competitor. But what is interesting is that these earliest reports still identified concerns or began to identify concerns about issues that today are sort of common knowledge. Everyone is talking about critical minerals, right? At dinner tables, you're talking about lithium ion batteries, critical minerals, all, all of these things. In 2013, um, there was already the acknowledgement that we were dependent on China for key components of, of some of these elements, in this case, energetics, which are the chemical compounds that are necessary for munitions. Um, also interesting is throughout these reports in the early years, uh, we're expressing increasing concern about the shift of microelectronics to Asia, and specifically, for instance, um, the long-term threat posed by the production of weapon systems that rely on these components, right? So these are not new problems, which is, you know, fundamentally, if I leave you with one issue, and yet we are still seeing a consistent description of these problems. And the timing for this little my little mini remarks here couldn't be better in a way because the Defense Department has just issued its most recent, well, they're calling it the first ever defense uh, industrial base strategy. I probably would, would dispute that um, because all of the previous reports that Andrew and I looked at are actually sort of have components of what we need to do to reduce these deficiencies. But what's interesting about this strategy, a couple of things uh, to highlight. One. Um, it identifies the problem as being one that has to be fixed in a generation. That's problematic. That's a long time. So we're, we're, we're discussing here and we're here because of the, the threat, the speed with which China acts, the agility, um, the fact in this period that we're talking about China has now surpassed us in many ways militarily as the Heritage um, Military Report will find out. So a generation is a long time for us to fix our defense industrial base from today, right? That's what the, the report says. Um, 
the four priorities listed in the report are not, not new. I mean, they're, we need to produce things at scale. Uh, second, we need a workforce. Okay, we've been discussing the workforce problem since at least 2009. At least, I'm pointing to that date because it's a date when President Obama at the time discussed it, I think, in one of his State of the Union speeches. I'm sure it, was, it pre-existed that as well, but that's sort of the, the time I use. That's a long time. Third, we need a flexible acquisition process. We've had 150 reports on acquisition reform, minimum, I think even more. Um, and, and fourth, you know, um, fourth is, I actually don't understand it, but it's, it's the con this concept of economic deterrence, which I understand. I don't understand the way this particular DOD report describes it. Um, but essentially, I think it relates to the idea of, of our economic dependence on China and the need to deter. So those four elements of this new industrial base strategy are not new. <laughs> that's all the sort of, that's the main point I want to make. And it's a real problem because we can no longer afford to start from scratch. And it's a challenge for every administration. You know, to be fair to the Biden administration, not just. It's a challenge for um, previous administrations as well. And any new administration coming in, a Republican administration coming in, has to not start from scratch and has to focus on the actual sets of recommendations that already exist and we need to focus on why we can't actually make progress on them. So um, that's, that's the bottom line. Thank Thanks. you, that was great. Um, Dr. Calhoun, you authored a chapter on China's COVID statistics that is um, filled with some rather shocking and eye-opening data points. Um, I wonder if you could talk to us a bit about some of the numbers that maybe most surprised you and generally about the gap between the official statistics China reported and our best guess on the actual impact of COVID inside China. Okay, well, uh, first to contextualize all of that, uh, if, I, if we dialed back one year ago, the general view in the US and financial circles and other circles was that China had just come out of zero COVID and was about to experience a boom, an economic upsurge. Um, that hasn't happened. We've touched on that. It, it seems to be uh, actually going the other way and in a very decisive <laughs> negative trajectory. And the question that is posed, I think, in a lot of circles is, well, what happened? What, what went wrong? And in that context, the COVID uh, experience of China uh, I think needs to be examined more closely. Um, the medical emergency created uh, what I call a data emergency also. The Chinese government, after about 90 days, uh, basically shut down all reporting related to uh, COVID mortality, COVID infection rates, COVID anything to do with the pandemic. And for two years, the mortality count was, was completely flatlined. Uh, when the zero COVID was, uh, policy was finally uh, lifted in December of 2022, uh, there was a small adjustment and then it was flatlined again. And it's clear that just looking at the pattern of the reporting in China that there is a suppression of the data related to uh, the pandemic there and the effects and the impl implications for the Chinese economy. To get at that, uh, you can't really, you can't of course rely upon the official reported uh, COVID statistics, but there are other official statistics that China does report that you can use to get an angle on it. And one of the, uh, I think, dramatic is the, the raw uh, death rate in China, uh, that deaths per, per thousand or deaths per hundred thousand. In 2019, jumped by about five times what the previous baseline had been for the previous 10 or 15 years, and it stayed elevated. And so there was a, some kind of public health emergency that began in 2019 and has continued until now that has elevated the death rate in China very significantly. And that's not something, this is based on data that's collected by the UN and the World Bank and other uh, international sources, and it's, I think, fairly reliable. Uh, you combine that with um, other 
bits of information that do come out, like the vaccination rates in China that um, were very low, uh, low, lower than they should have been. There were still tens of millions of Chinese uh, elderly over the age of 70, over the age of 80, uh, that were unvac completely unvaccinated when zero COVID was lifted, um, and tens of millions more that were only partially vaccinated. And of course, the vaccines uh, that were used in China have been cr critiqued for their efficacy. Uh, so um, it's pretty clear that the, the numbers are are significant. A number of uh, uh, organizations have tried to get a handle on it. I, one of the ones that I think has done the most thorough job is The Economist magazine has been modeling what they call excess mortality all over the world in, in every country. And there are discrepancies between reports and, and apparent mortality rates in every country, including the United States. And some are one way and some are the other way. But the the estimates that they uh, derive uh, are consistent with the estimates that I derive from looking at the raw mortality figures and some of the other figures, suggests that there were there have been uh, at least 3 million, 4 million, maybe twice that many deaths in China as a result of COVID, uh, concentrated among the unvaccinated elderly, concentrated in rural areas where the uh, uh, healthcare system was uh, quickly overwhelmed. And by, I mean, the Chinese uh, official sources have leaked, indicated that uh, within a very short period after lifting the, the zero COVID policy in December 2022, uh, hundreds of millions of Chinese were infected. And if you just look at the infection rates, the uh, mortality rates that would that you would see in other zero COVID countries like uh, or quasi zero COVID countries like New Zealand, like Hong Kong, and apply those ratios to the mainland of China, you come with similar numbers. M millions of Chinese uh, have almost certainly uh, died as a result of, of COVID. And the healthcare system has been uh, put under pressure and probably overwhelmed in many parts of the country, apparently. And I think this is one of the major reasons behind the economic uh, stagnation and slowdown that they're experiencing. I think they have, it has been a, a disruptive factor to uh, the Chinese economy in many ways, in the production side, in the consumption side. And um, so that's what my, my, uh, my study has tried to capture. That's fascinating. Thank you very much for that. Um, I do want to turn to audience questions uh, soon, but I may digress and start uh, our questioning with a statement of my own. One of the areas that I track and maybe can shine some a light of transparency on is, is, is also COVID and COVID's origins. And I can tell you now that with maybe 99% certainty that COVID started in a lab in Wuhan, China. And I can tell you with 100% certainty that there's been a cover-up attempt inside China and a cover-up attempt here to hide the origins of COVID. I can tell you that anyone who told you that a lab leak was a conspiracy and that natural origin was settled science was either grossly misinformed or deliberately misleading you. Uh, we will be working on this question more uh, in the months and years to come, so please keep an eye out for that. But I do believe the origins of COVID is an important question given the fact that over 20 million people have been killed. Second, TikTok. It is an espionage and propaganda vector of the Chinese Communist Party. We know that. We've known it for years. That's why we banned it on government phones many years ago. Why we allow it to be on the phones of millions of young Americans spreading propaganda, you know, filtering out their algorithms, I don't, I don't know. It's unclear to me. I know it's hard, Congress. I know your old chief of staff is now a TikTok lobbyist, busy not passing bills, but we have work to do. If we don't want to be a banana republic, we need to get the espionage apps off of our phones. That's it. That's my, my, my piece for now. Question and answer. Andrew, are you going to be manning the Q&A? OK, we have mics floating around. Yes, sir. So I'm very curious to ask you, um, 
you know, why hasn't U.S. Uh, have any uh, army bases in Nepal or even s- some part of eastern uh, India? I see you have 30,000 in Japan, which seem way far off from Nepal and eastern part of India, which you can serve a lot of bases. And also, I want to uh, verify, does China have more international missions than U.S.? I saw it has over 171, and yeah. U.S. has... I just want to make I don't mind the adjacent questions. That's not even in the same zip code. So we can talk about that after the program if you like, but I'd prefer to keep the questions targeted to the panelists we have. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh. All right. <clears throat> Come to you next. Thanks so much. I'm a, oh, uh, Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, so... Regarding the declining economy of China, I agree. Um, I'm curious, what would that look like here? Uh, so I think one of the, the questions that seems like a intractable problem is the, the interdependence of our economies. And so, I mean, even if China's economy were cut in half by GDP, it would still be number two. Uh, but what would that do to us? Would that trigger a global depression of some sort in markets and so what's going on there i'm i'm in for the long haul i i will tighten the belt if it will help us to oust the ccp but i want to know what are some of the moral hazards involved in in that attempt by us and is there a reason we're not trying harder yeah and what does the you know what does the world look like with and what does chinese foreign policy look like with an economy growing at Two percent or three percent versus ten percent. I mean, do we really even understand the full implications of this seemingly long-term structural change in China's growth trajectory, Dr. Lam, and then anyone else who would like to jump in? Just on the U.S. side, I'll yeah. just quickly say. I mean, I think that's part of the rationale for some of this discussion of supply chain shifts, right? To reduce our dependence, our external dependence, to become more resilient at home. So. That is part, that's the strategic rationale, um, the point that you made to reduce the effects of that interdependency. So that's just on the U.S. side. But. Okay, well, uh, regarding the Chinese economy, uh, well, nobody believes in what uh, Prime Minister Li Chang alleged at the uh, World Economic Forum that GDP grew by 5.2% last year. I think... Uh, Various uh, uh, research groups, including Rodian and so forth, said that 1.5% was uh, perhaps closer to the truth. And if you ask me, I think it is even less than 1.5%. The big problem is that, uh, as uh, former Prime Minister Zhu Rongji said, uh, the GDP, the economic pie of China, needs to grow by at least 7% uh, for the economy to generate the trickle-down effect to help the great uh, normal people because the bulk of the growth of the economic pie, uh, we can assume that automatically they go to the privileged and the uh, uh, the new aristocracies within the party. So for that trickle-down uh, impact to the ordinary people to take effect, you need a GDP growth of at least 6 7%, and this is not going to happen. Well, we must remember that uh, China is a country that does not have ballot box legitimacy. So there are only two pillars of uh, legit- legitimacy left. One is the uh, steady increase of the standard of living of the people, which is now uh, not happening at all, and we don't see this uh, happening again. So uh, much more emphasis is now being put <coughs> by Xi Jinping <coughs> on, on nationalism, okay, on nationalism. and. Uh, that's why uh, I uh, emphasize the fact that uh, he is still obsessed with this uh, Mao Zedong edict uh, of the uh, the East is rising, the West is declining, and he is putting out all the stops to uh, nurture a so-called axis of auto- autocratic states consisting of a, uh, which is a, se- a China-centric uh, a new assemblage of countries consisting of China, Russia, uh, North Korea, uh, Pakistan, uh, Iran, and so forth, uh, which uh, Xi Jinping is convinced can uh, displace the uh, U.S.-led uh, uh, international order, which was first established after World War II. So, 
uh, <clears throat> but of course, uh, there are holes in, in all these arguments, and that is, uh, in order to uh, 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 consummate, to, to, to uh, bring about the realization of its very ambitious foreign policy goals vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, South China Sea, and so forth, uh, China needs a lot of money, okay? China needs a lot of money. Uh, look at what's happening to the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Okay, China was initially successful in the first 10 years of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, winning hearts and minds in, uh, uh, in the Global South, in Africa, and so forth, but uh, money is running out, okay? Money is running out. So here we see a big contradictory, a big contradiction, okay? On the one hand, Xi Jinping seems not to care that much about uh, livelihood issues, about the uh, shrinkage, shrinkage of the economic pie, but on the other hand, Without those uh, uh, foreign exchange reserves, without those um, uh, financial resources, he could not um, uh, effectuate and, and, and uh, consummate, uh, bring to consummation his uh, foreign policy goals to uh, jack up nationalism, which is now pretty much the only uh, pillar of, of legitimacy left. So we still. Uh, see a big uh, contradiction in uh, Xi Jinping's style of uh, one-man politics, one person running the show, right? Dr. Cohen, did you want to take a stab? Just a very quick comment. I think when you do your 2025 transparency report, you probably want to have a chapter also on the quality of the economic statistics like the GDP. GDP is not, uh, in the third quarter of last year, China reported a 4.9% GDP growth. The US reported the same number, 4.9%. The celebration in the US was an incredibly robust economy. The commentary on the Chinese number was that this was indication of uh, continuing stagnation and decline. It, this indicates that the numbers aren't, they don't refer to the same thing, and there's a lot of uh, unpeeling of that onion that uh, needs to be done. So maybe for next year's. Uh, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Of course, this only gets worse with time, and there's no Gorbachev waiting in the wings. So somewhere around 1950, we decided that the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was incompatible with civilization, and we invested a lot of resources uh, to break that party, and largely did so through information operations, even more than our uh, military investments. So I got to ask. When does the campaign begin to break the Communist Party of China? Where's the secret committee on the National Security Council? Where are the covert operations coming from our intelligence agencies? Where's the think tank in DC that works on overt and covert means of breaking the Communist Party? I see nothing. Do we want to group together two? I think that's all we'll have time for is one final round of questions. So do we have a second here? Excuse me. So, All right, so um, the question uh, is with the uh, human rights section of the report. Um, one thing that I noticed that was absent from it was the uh, CCP's persecution of the Falun Gong. Um, where in the uh, 2022 uh, Department of State International Religious Freedom Report, um, it continues to be one of the largest groups of prison prisoners of conscience in China today. Um, and they're still being targeted for forced organ harvesting alongside the Uyghur Muslims. They're a, a, major, a major source of organ harvesting. So I would love to get your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, Dr. Zenz isn't here. Um, to speak more about the, the human rights section that he did. Um, but I, I can tell you that the, the problems of human rights in China are manifold, and you really would need a whole book or a series of volumes to go in depth in each one of the cases where, where China's, the Chinese government's behavior has been horrendous, to be frank. Um, but a very fair question. Um, would anyone like to take a stab at the first? It it's an excellent point. I think a couple of reasons. I don't think there's the same level of consensus um, writ large on the ideological threat to the United States posed by the CCP. So people in this room agree. I don't think writ large there's fundamental um, agreement on that. 
I think it's a systemic struggle, an ideological struggle. I think second, you know, we don't have the op, who is, who is doing the information operations. Back during the Cold War, the actual technical architecture was in some ways simpler. You also had a USIA, the United States Information Agency. I don't think that's practical today. Today you have platforms owned by multinational companies, they're not really American companies, that are ambivalent about getting in this fight, unless of course, I guess I'm being a little snarky, they're doing it domestically, right? <laughs> Which uh, we, saw, we saw a lot of cooperation um, on that. So I think we don't have a both a, a strategic consensus, but also an operational plan or concept for how how you uh, how you operate in the information domain. Mm -hmm. So more work needs to be done. Just real quick to add to that, um, the public opinion is going to be the I think the driver of the strategic consensus or one of them, and you're probably all aware that public opinion of China regarding China views on China has shifted uh, from pretty positive to extremely negative. And the driver of that, according to the polls that I've looked at, is the COVID experience by and large. That's what the, the broad public understands that more than they understand a lot of the other issues. Right. Yeah, that, yeah, that's interesting. Had COVID not happened, would that same shift have taken place? Yeah. I did notice um, in looking at just the simple approval, disapproval um, figures, Pre-COVID, or maybe 2014, American public opinion was over 50% uh, yes. approved of China. Yes. Now, post-COVID, it's more like 15%. Yeah. So it, it had a shocking impact on, on public opinion. Dr. Calhoun, Dr. Shadlow, well, uh, I, Dr. I, Lamb, I, I do you just, have a closing remark yeah, for yeah, us? Well, I, I Wonderful. I have a quick digression. Please. Um, I actually lived and worked in Wuhan for four years. Hmm. Okay. So I'm one of the few uh, foreigners who had uh, spent four full years living and working in Wuhan. And I can vouch for your uh, <laughs> <laughs> conclusions earlier. I think that's, that's beyond a doubt that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the germ or whatever you will uh, comes from the lab, mm. uh, comes from the, there's this famous or infamous uh, uh, fox lady, you know, who, has, has been doing research uh, in the Yunnan province uh, caves for decades, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, there are no foxes in Wuhan, and uh, the only fox you find is in the caves in the faraway uh, Yunnan province. But she's the only person with that experience, and I think uh, whether you uh, uh, subscribe to this conspiracy theory that it was a deliberate uh, government uh, usage of biological weapon or not, I think most likely, uh, I think it's beyond doubt that uh, the the virus or the germ uh, comes from the lab, mm. right, right. Here, here's the simple reality of that. If we had an objective panel here and we presented all of the evidence supporting the idea that this escaped from a lab, and all of the evidence that it was a scientific or uh, natural evolution or zoonotic evolution. Um, if you had a panel of 10 objective experts, it would be 10 and 0 every single time. And we could run it back over and over again. The evidence is so overwhelming on one side of this debate. If you see it presented side by side, it would eliminate all doubt. And at some point, we'll have an opportunity to do that. And I look forward to that day. Uh, to all our panelists, thank you very much. To Andrew Harding, thank you very much. To everyone in the audience, thank you, thank you very much for coming out. We'll be around for questions afterward um, if anyone's interested. Thank you.